Hi everyone, I'm sorry I can't make it there in person. Um, travel's been a bit of a trouble getting down to uh, to the Coventry area, but thanks a lot to Jen and the team uh, for making this a hybrid um, physical virtual session. So uh, here I am through the magic of the internet. Um, I'm just going to do the usual uh, share of screen and um, get everything running up. So give me a moment. There we go, and move into full screen. So um, today I'm going to be talking briefly about uh, a concept of the corrupted campfire in John Carpenter's film, The Thing. Um, obviously the entire um, a couple of days today is around uh, campfire tales. And I'm going to look at how, what happens when that fire starts to fail and change in strange ways. Um, my name's Dan Peterson, and my uh, Twitter handle is down there in the bottom right. Um, if you want to tweet along, um, or if you want to get in touch and ask questions or anything like that afterwards, um, you're more than welcome to get in touch with me through Twitter. Um, there's also the hashtag down there as well for people who might be um, doing some tweeting. So we've got our introduction screen there, but if we're gonna be talking about corrupted campfires, then what is a campfire? Thankfully, in another film of John Carpenter's, The Fog, which was released a few years before The Thing, um, he talks about um, campfires at the very start of the film. There is a kind of introductory section where um, a, a storyteller is talking to children about what will be happening later in the film. So I'm gonna use quite a loose um, version of what a campfire is. It's a place of safety. Um, it is a place of respite somewhere where you can sit uh, and warm yourself um, physically and sometimes um, psychically in a way. However, at the edge of that fi firelight, at the edge of the flame, there is potentially danger. There is darkness, there are woods, there are creatures and monsters. But with the difference between light and dark, there is a clear boundary between the two. As long as you stay within the bounds of firelight, as long as you stay close to the flame, then you'll be safe from the darkness outside. And that, I think, is used in a lot of um, different kinds of texts and narratives, stories. Um, we have this idea of somewhere safe, um, and as long as you stay close to the fire, you will remain safe. And that's used even in media um, that are notoriously dangerous and unpleasant. Dark Souls, for example, um, a game where violence, difficulty, danger is its attraction, uses the bonfire as a save point. It is one of the only places where you are safe from harm. But we're talking about corrupted bonfires, corrupted campfires. And even in the fog, we go back to that, Carpenter allows for campfires to be corrected. And the storyteller there, who's called Mr. Macken, in a bit of a nod to Arthur Macken, I think, when he's introdu introducing the tale of the fog, he says this. 100 years ago, on the 21st of April, out in the waters around Spivey Point, a small clipper ship drew toward land. Suddenly, out of the night, the fog rolled in. For a moment, they could see nothing, not a foot in front of them. Then they saw a light. By God, it was a fire burning on the shore, strong enough to penetrate the swirling mist. They steered a course toward the light, but it was a campfire like this one. The ship crashed against the rocks. The hull sheared in two, mass snapped like a twig. The wreckage sank with all the men aboard. So even Carpenter here allows that campfires can turn against you. They can be turned against people. It turns out later on that it's wreckers who have set up a fire to purposely attract the ship to the shore. So campfires can normally, assumedly, be a safe place and a place of refuge, but they can also turn and become corrupted. So I'm going to look at that now in um, in the thing, um, and here we have a screenshot. Um, we have um, a group of men surrounding a campfire. If you've seen the film, you will know that that fire is not entirely normal. It is not, for example, made out of wood or coal. 
We'll talk about what it is made out of later on. But briefly to talk about the thing itself, um, it's directed by John Carpenter, uh, released in 1982, and it became the first part of um, what's been called Carpenter's Apocalypse Trilogy, um, talking about the end of the world in different ways. That's followed by A Prince of Darkness in 1997, one of my favourite films, and In the Mouth of Madness uh, in 1994. They kind of become increasingly cosmic and Lovecraftian as you go through the trilogy. Ultimately, though, it's an adaptation of Who Goes There, a novella by um, John W. Campbell, which was from um, a few years ago. Um, that was has been adapted previously as a film called The Thing from Another World, um, a bit more of a B-movie kind of attempt. Um, the Thing looks at this in a darker way. It's, it's fairly um, uh, true to the novella, but it adds in um, other elements um, as well. John Carpenter's kind of um, obsessions and tropes. It's set in what was at the time in the 80s, a modern day American research station in Antarctica. But um, as is inevitable in films like this, things go awry when that research station becomes overrun by a shape-shifting alien entity. It's well thought of today by horror fans. Um, it's often up there in the top uh, lists of uh, horror films and horror um, media. But at the time, it was not well received, largely. Um, Linda Gross, writing in the LA Times, says that it's bereft, despairing and nihilistic. And the Washington Post's correspondent, Gary Arnold, called it a wretched excess. It seemed to fall flat for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them could well be that for a film that is set in Antarctica in the middle of winter, it was released in the middle of summer, possibly not the kind of film people might want to see. And for admittedly a very nihilistic film, Linda does get that right, um, it, it was going up against films like E.T., so a fairly positive, child-friendly sci-fi film, and Blade Runner, which is much more of a kind of, you could say, an accomplished sci-fi film, um, certainly considered more of a serious film. The Thing got relegated to uh, a monster creature feature B-movie, which um, did not do wonders for Carpenter's career as a filmmaker, sadly. But I want to focus less on the film um, and more on this idea of the station itself, the base, um, the research post um, called Outpost 31. That there is an image from a board game from a few years ago, um, which uh, sort of plays upon the themes of the, um, of the film. But I think it gives a nice stark view of what it must be like to live on a research base in Antarctica in the middle of winter. So going back to those ideas of what a campfire is, it's my suggestion as part of this talk that the base itself, initially at least, acts as a campfire. It's a place of safety. Um, you can see there the people who work and live on the base um, are relaxing, having fun, playing games, reading, playing music. It looks like somewhere where they have um, some kind of respite, like you would expect from a campfire with all around them is the darkness and the cold of Antarctica. However, the darkness and the cold has not gone away and the base is surrounded by danger. Um, the danger of exposure, of um, the uh, threats to survival that the deep cold of Antarctica um, possesses. And you can see there, very small is one of the camp's helicopters. So the vastness um, of Antarctica here cannot be underestimated. And there are clear boundaries. There is possibly the oldest boundary, the inside versus the outside. That will come into different layers later on, but initially, at least to start with, it is the fairly prosaic boundary of walls, windows and doors. You can see the dog there gazing out of the window. Perhaps it isn't entirely a dog, however. So how did this become corrupted? See their screen from when they first discover the remnants, um, or at least what they believe to be remnants, of the alien creature that is known only as the Thing. And it's quite easy, I think, to see how this becomes corrupted. The Thing itself is, I think, a text about corruption. It talks about what happens when your form and your identity are usurped and taken over. The way that this alien entity works, which seems to be more of a virus than an actual um, creature or being, it mimics um, living things. It takes on their form and then uses that 
to infect other creatures uh, by gaining their trust, or it, indeed just by hiding in plain sight. You can see there the results of what happens when the creature is revealed. One of the characters um, suddenly starts shaking and transforming and dissolving in a way. He has the ability to leap and grab onto the ceiling, uh, which is where he can then attack other people. The results are, as you can see, fairly horrible. But it's not just concerned about corruption in that kind of way. What it does talk about a lot, and I think it's um, a, an element that was missed by initial reviewers, is that it talks about what happens when trust and even humanity start to corrupt. At the start of the film, um, the members of the team at the Antarctic station have a kind of um, banter, as you might imagine, some kind of rivalries and things like that. But they also have camaraderie. They work together. Um, they work in teams, they all have their roles, and they um, do the job that's assigned to them. As the film goes on, that begins to collapse. And what happens is that they become much more individualistic, paranoid, and violent. You see here McCready, who's effectively the hero, if there is a hero in the film, he um, becomes so um, alone and uh, isolated from the rest of the group, so paranoid that he's willing to destroy everybody else with explosives rather than be captured himself and um, imprisoned and potentially fall victim to the thing. And we can see that in those three elements of a campfire start to fall apart. So paranoia, fear, terror, eventually, this unthinking terror eventually destroys any sense of safety that may well be in the base. Weapons are pulled on each other, um, guns, flamethrowers, explosives, axes, um, are used against uh, the inhabitants of the base and the base itself. One character destroys the radio that would be able to um, let them call for help. The danger that surrounds them, so the cold and the dark of the Antarctic winter, winter, uh, winter actually becomes more of a respite than the inside of the base. So leaving the safety of the campfire, becoming isolated and alone, actually becomes the safer option. If you're alone, then you can't be infected by the thing. And finally, those clear boundaries, that inside and outside starts to be breached. The doors are left open, the building starts to get destroyed um, as the inhabitants fight back against the thing and each other. So the walls are pierced and the outside starts to become confused with the inside. And in Antarctica, that is not a safe thing to do. Snow and cold and the environmental threat starts to build up on top of the threat of the creature. Eventually, the camp itself becomes, ironically, a campfire, um, as the few weapons that the, um, the inhabitants of the base have are things like flamethrowers, explosives, they damage the base as much as they damage the creature. And as the creature itself moves from uh, person to person, the extent of the damage increases to the end where all they can do is destroy um, the creature itself through massive use of explosives. So you have the base, by becoming a campfire, becomes destroyed and becomes um, a remnant, ashes largely, the lack of a campfire. And this also, horrifyingly, happens to the uh, team in the base. If they become infected or are suspected of being infected, the others turn on them with the purifying flame of their flamethrowers. And as we saw earlier on in that slide, um, they themselves become torches, become campfires smoldering in the glow of the larger campfire that is the base. And as that base turns into a campfire, rather than huddling around it, as you might expect from a true uncorrupted campfire, as the, um, the base uh, starts to burn and collapse and turn into embers, the survivors are forced to flee and move to the edges of that campfire, the shadows, the boundary between the um, safety and danger. And McCready there um, huddles up um, with the only source of warmth that he has left, a bottle of whiskey. And that's towards the end of the film. And you're realising now that what was once a place of safety has been destroyed, has been corrupted by the invasive forces of the thing. 
So I think it's been fairly quick run through some of the uh, the ideas, I think, in the film is that Carpenter probably wanted when he made this film to take uh, one of his main tropes, one of his main concerns is this kind of siege format, the, um, the invasion of safe spaces. Previous films from Carpenter, things like Assault on Precinct 13 in 76, Halloween famously um, is about being stalked, is about the uh, places where you believe to be safe collapsing. And then the fog that we mentioned all have this kind of siege mentality. It is um, normal people going about their business and then suddenly some kind of threat, a riot, a serial killer, um, the ghosts of long dead sailors coming out of the darkness and putting you to siege. But in The Thing, I think the horror comes less from the monster. So say in the Assault on Precinct 13, the worst thing can happen to you is that you get killed. That's pretty bad. It's probably one of the worst things that you could have happen to you normally. But in um, in The Thing, the worst thing that can happen to you is that your personality can be corrupted and overwhelmed. And it then causes this idea of what would happen if the ideas of coherence could fall apart. We often think of ourselves as discrete things that walk around in the world. We can interact with other things and other beings, but we ourselves um, are always um, within ourselves. We can tell what's us and what isn't us. What happens when that starts to uh, fade apart? It starts to smear, literally, when things can pierce into what you are and who you are without you necessarily knowing. That becomes quite a Christavian idea of um, abjection and this disgust of what happens when boundaries um, are, are collapsed. And that's obviously there's the, the element of special effects um, and gore and um, all those good things that you get from horror films. But I think the concept of the slime and the drooling and all of these tendrils and things like that that come out of the thing um, are a nod, possibly subconsciously, a nod towards this idea of what happens when coherence starts to collapse, when safety starts to fail and boundaries are broken. So it allows, as well, ultimately, the invasion of this thing, and it's never really referred to as anything else but a thing, this um, amorphous, indefinable horror, um, doesn't just walk in to the uh, firelight of the campfire, so imagine in a, uh, some kind of fairy tale, you can see the, the monster come in to the campfire light from beyond the forest, but it pierces into the people sat around the campfire. And it does that physically. So it literally infects um, through some kind of virus or the bacteria or some kind of DNA thing. It's never really explained um, by the, um, uh, the infection process of taking over hum humans. But even those who are left uninfected are infected mentally, paranoia starts to set in, fear, distrust, all of those things that we think should exist within a campfire, warmth, um, companionship, team um, thoughts of being part of a group of people become um, impossible when you can't trust those around you because you don't know what those around you are. And it's interesting, I think, that as in that poster, later, um, posters, uh, at least uh, not the, necessarily the initial ones, um, which called the, the, the thing the ultimate in alien terror, but it's moved to um, the slogan, man is the warmest place to hide. And that's interesting because it gives this idea that the thing perhaps is trying in its own way to gain refuge. It's looking for a campfire of its own. And it just so happens that the warmth and the campfire that it's looking for is the warmth found inside human bodies. And that then, I think, moves back to this image that I've uh, I used as my title screen. I feel really bad because I've not been able to find um, the artist's name, the, 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 the curse of Pinterest strikes. I can find lots of versions of it, but not who, um, who, who drew it. But I think what they've done very nicely is that not only do they use the kind of alien spiky remains for the fire, but if you look at the shadows, of the creatures around it. Not all of them are entirely human. It's a very good way, I think, of reflecting the, um, the themes of the film. So that's, again, a very quick run through of why I was thinking about the thing. Um, if you do want to get in touch, 
Um, I've used another um, bearded character there um, to uh, to illustrate me in absentia. Um, but if you do want to get in touch, uh, if we have any time at the end, I don't know how um, questions will work with the recordings. Um, I do hope you enjoyed that, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you very much.